Hello everyone, the theme of this year's conference is See Your Vision Through. See your vision through. To see a world in a grain of sand and a heaven in a wild flower. Hold infinity in the palm of your hand and eternity in an hour. Now those words were written at the beginning of the 19th century by the visionary poet and artist William Blake. His was an inner vision, a beautiful inner vision of what we might see if we think and imagine for ourselves. But for architects, mostly the visions that they work with and apply in their own work that affect them psychologically, aesthetically, technically, are visions from outside. They're not like this poetic vision. And they come from all sorts of sources, mostly external sources, not internal, and they come as if from above. Now, you know this if you look inside your wallets. I don't know if you have wallets today with cash in, but if you do have cash, on your dollar bills, of course, you will see the great architect staring out at you, keeping an eye on you the whole time. And you'll find the great architect in buildings, built into buildings, staring out at you as well and keeping a good eye on you. And if you happen to be Chinese and a member of the Communist Party and a delegate to the Communist Party conferences every year, the great seeing red star eye of the Communist Party will look down on you from a constellation of lights from the ceiling of the Great Hall of the People in Beijing. Or today, for all of us, whether you're in China, Britain, America, Australia, wherever you are, there is the all-seeing eye the cold all-seeing eye of artificial intelligence and communications technology. We live in a strangely visionary world, but not a poetic one, I think, or not very often. And that is the theme of this talk. What I want you to do, if you can, is to hold in your architect's eyes, your architectural student eyes, your architectural professor eyes, the idea that Blake expressed of seeing a world in a grain of sand. And that's especially important for today when many of us have had, through no fault of our own, our wings clipped. We're not allowed to travel as we were, but we can think with our inner imagination. The vision I want to say, architectural vision, handed down from above and not coming out from you, can be a very dangerous thing indeed. You all know, I'm sure, who these two characters are, and they're not so very pleasant. This is, of course, Adolf Hitler and his pet architect, Albert Speer. What they're doing here is dreaming up a vision of the new city of Berlin that was going to be built post-war, Germania. And look where they are. They're planning this from the Berghof, Hitler's country retreat in the Alps, Bavarian Alps, as if they're like gods, looking down from their eagle-like eyrie, and they're going to create a city, unlike any other city in the world that's so enormous the ancient Rome would seem like a child's toy. This city, which was going to be built after the German triumph in the Second World War, uh, featured at its centre a three kilometre long axis, which you see there, starting at the bottom of the picture from this great railway station. And from out of there, you would parade through a great victory arch that's designed by Adolf Hitler himself, and then along to the Volkshalle, the People's Hall, a People's Hall that was a thousand foot tall and so big, that dome you see on top of it, so big that the oculus at the top, the eye at the top, the all-seeing eye at the top of the dome, you could fit Michelangelo's dome or St Peter's in Rome straight through it and place it inside the building. You could then take St Paul's Cathedral in London slip it through the top of the dome and put it alongside St Peter's in Rome and those two giant cathedrals would fit inside the People's Hall by Albert Speer. And inside, boy, look at this. Inside, 180,000 Sikh heiling Nazis would be there parading in front of their leader, their Führer, their visionary leader. And what sort of vision was this? Terrifying. And to add to the terror and now you'll be glad, to comic effect. At the end of the Second World War, Canadian and American military engineers 
talked to Speer and his assistants and worked out that if you had 180,000 people in this space, their breath would rise to the top of the dome, form clouds, and believe it or not, it would rain. So the rain would fall on Hitler's parade. But here they are, architect, visionary architect, visionary patron. Look at them, one body, as it were, two heads, and the architect's arm raised like a Nazi salute, placing a Nazi eagle on top of this building. This was the Paris Exhibition Building for 1937, an expo building, which showed the might of Nazi Germany. Strangely enough, these visions didn't come just from totalitarian regimes of the 20th century. Albert Speer himself got many of his ideas of these grandiose, bombastic, huge buildings from a fairly innocent French architect of the 18th century called Etienne Louis Boulet. He dreamed up here a building which looks pretty terrifying. That's looking down on top. And here we are looking in front of the building. This is the cenotaph to Newton, the cenotaph to Isaac Newton. Newton was admired by the French in the 18th century, French rationalist thinkers, and they saw this as a possibility, a dream of course, a possibility of building a monument to reason. And yet, how unreasonable this building would have been. At night, you'd have walked in, it would have been lit by great lanterns. It's very exciting. If Boulet was alive today, as they say, he would have been a fantastic set designer, art director for the films. But in practice, if this had been built, it would have been terrifying. No wonder Speer and Hitler loved it. Boulet also designed this. This is a metropolitan cathedral for the centre of Paris. Can you see the clouds climbing up towards the side of the dome? It probably have rained inside here as well. And look at the size of the people. They're just like insects. If it had been built, it would have looked something like this. Icy cold, far too big, far too muscular, crushing the human spirit. And yet, of course, the images are really, really exciting and seductive. Visions, architectural visions, can be deeply appealing and they can affect generations of architects. This, another Boulay project, is his idea for a library now in the centre of Paris. But look here, again at the size of the people, and look at the size of the books in relation to the size of the gigantic building. Here, architecture triumphs clearly over literature. It's the architecture that matters most, the architectural form that's dominant. Now you may say, well, that's all in the past. Oh, no, it's not. Have a look here. This is a brand new bookshop in China, in a new Chinese city. Look at it. It's like a sort of modern version of Boulay translated through a computer and a filmic eye. It's pretty strange. It's glorious to look at. Very odd and weird to be in, because it throws you, as does being in this structure. This is the vessel. It's just an enormous complicated staircase in the Hudson Yards in New York, built for property developers. You go up it, you walk around it, and you see property development, pretty ugly property development around it. Strange, isn't it? A sort of an empty vessel. A sort of architecture, I suppose, that both Hitler's architecture, Boulay's architecture, all these heavy, grand visions that go right up to today of structures, architecture, trying desperately to impress us, and I think actually slight to crush us, they lead, us, lead us into a creative black hole. This is the visionary young Swiss-French architect Le Cabusier in the 1920s. He was a young architect then and about to create a revolution in architecture. He really is one of the most important modern architects. He was a person who changed the way we look and see architecture. And one of the plans he had sponsored by a wealthy industrialist, is this. In 1925, this is the Plan Voisin for Paris. 18 cruciform-shaped glass towers, very tall indeed, to house a mixture of offices and uh, hotels and apartments, but particularly working-class housing. In other words, everybody, whether you're a bureaucrat, a retailer, or a plumber, would have the same level of accommodation. The idea seems quite noble, but to do this would have meant knocking down a great chunk of Paris. And this is what one young German architect 
working today, Clement Skrittle, has used his computers to show what it might have really been like if Plan Voisin has been built. You can see in the slightly centre right, you'll see Notre Dame. There it is. And that is the north of central Paris, rebuilt by Le Corbusier, as it might have been, say, in the 1970s. I mean, pretty terrifying stuff. And cut through not with romantic auto routes of Le Corbusier's imagination, with beautiful, elegant cars breezing along and a few biplanes buzzing in the sky, but by this grim, dark motorways, polluted and smoky. And we know that's what it would have been like didn't happen and thankfully we'll always have Paris as a result but perhaps it did happen but it didn't happen in Paris it happened far far away now look at these apartment blocks very Cabusier like really um, in a way aren't they and what fantastic photographs they make it's a photographer's dream isn't it a filmmaker's dream hell though, for the people that live here. These, of course, are apartments in Hong Kong, central Hong Kong. They're absolutely grim. And actually, is this visionary architecture from Le Corbusier or just a mess? Well, obviously, the latter, this too, is a mess as well. And this is a very wealthy part of a very wealthy city in the first world. Do you know where it is? Look at it. Unplanned, thoughtless, witless, towers just shoved up any which way. Who cares what they look like? Some of them are quite good buildings, but they'd be perhaps better in Shanghai or San Francisco. Um, have you guessed? This is the city of London. This is where I come from, and I find it pretty sad because it lacks all vision. The idea that these modern buildings would somehow be just plonked around the place willy-nilly is not what early modern architects of the caliber and generation of Le Corbusier really wanted to do. I think if you look at this beautiful drawing, this montage and charcoal drawing by Cabusier's contemporary Ludwig Mies van der Rohe, a German architect, for a glass tower in 1921 in Berlin and Friedrichstrasse, you'll see how poetic an architectural vision of a modern future could be. This really is seeing the world, not so much in a grain of sand, but through panes of glass. The reason, by the way, this building couldn't be built, and it certainly couldn't at the time, was just simply the technology wasn't there to do it. You just couldn't hang great sheets of glass from a steel frame at the time. That came a lot later, and from the United States in particular. These visions have a habit of falling, tumbling away, disappearing into that black hole we saw. If you go to Berlin, this is all you'll find of Albert Speer's giant domed People's Hall of Uxhala. What is it? This is a, a column for testing the weight of the building on the ground. And actually the ground below here is quite sodden. It's quite marshy and wet. So God knows if that great building might have sunk. Um, what else is left of Albert Speer's Great Berlin, Hitler's Great Vision? Well, there's a couple of um, these. These are kiosks for pedestrian subways. And there's some street lamps. And that's it and of Hitler's study in Berlin, where, again, he dreamt up many of these grand schemes and awful evil schemes too. Look at it. Well, this is where he planned, most of all, world domination, as uh, satirised here by Charlie Chaplin at the time in his film The Great Dictator. But look, May 1945. That's all that's left of Hitler's office in Albert Speer's Right Chancery Building hubris, humiliation, that great, horrible Nazi experiment, humbled, and of course, quite rightly so. Well, what about Boulay? What about that architect with his great schemes we saw, his great cathedral, his great library? Well, there's one or two um, rather smart and grand and innovative, for the time, houses on the edge of Paris, like this one here, the Hotel Alexandra in eastern Paris. But um, even that has been fronted. You've seen bits of the other, a new building around it, fronted by a really grim modern office block that houses basically a sewage company. That was Boulay done for. In 16th century India, Akbar the Great, a great emperor, decided to build a new city, Fatabha Sikri. It means the city of victory. 
He started building in 1571 and, this time, I have to say, is utterly magnificent. Beautiful, beautiful city. 1571, 1583 it was abandoned. Look at the effort that went into this. Why was it abandoned? It's often said it was because of a lack of water, and I think uh, maybe that's partly true. The real reason is that Akbar the Great himself lost interest. Just like that. This grand visionary who wanted to build this great city to uh, celebrate his military victories decided to go on another great military campaign out into the Punjab that ran for a very long time. And as he went, his court went with him, his soldiers went with him, and everybody just gave up the ghost. And nobody's really known what to do with the of a secret since, except, of course, it's a magnificent tourist attraction. Here's the heart of a 20th century visionary city. This is the President's Palace in Brasilia, right in the heart of Brazil. Brasilia was a city created by, invented by, declared by, Juscelino Kubitschek. He was a visionary democratic president of Brazil, and interestingly, the idea of this new city was written into the Brazilian constitution from the end of the 18th century. In the 1950s, early 60s, they built it. They built it all in five years. The palace was designed by an architect who matched the vision of President Kubitschek. This was Oscar Niemeyer, who died just a few years ago at the age of 104, and worked up to the last minute. Uh, Niemeyer created wonderful, humane buildings. This is his own home in Rio de Janeiro, Look at it, really a lovely thing, glamorous, modern, rooted in nature. And yet, when it came to designing the wider city with the planner Lucia Costa, look at it. How different is that really? I don't mean in libertarian spirit or in terms of democracy or politics, but how different is it physically really from that great big Speer and Hitler plan for Berlin? That's a bit worrying, isn't it? A nominally democratic country producing this. And it's not a fun place to be in, because if you walk across here in the blazing heat of Brazil in the summer, with cars roaring everywhere, that's no fun at all. Where was the humanity? It's the grandness of the plan, I think, did for Brasilia and makes it pretty inhumane. You may disagree. Well, what was the solution? In France, it, which is a country that has lots of grand plans for architecture and presidential grand plans. Here, in the 1980s, was a grand plan back again for social housing. If Le Cabuzzi had made a mistake with his plan voisin and those great big apartment blocks we've seen through Hong Kong and indeed the rest of the world, which are pretty grim places to live in, um, could we do something better? And look at this. What about Versailles for the people? What about putting working class people in palaces, in great Roman palaces? Well, it sounds quite um, exciting, doesn't it? And also a bit nuts. But the trouble, look, is this. Here the ambition was too big, I think, for the budget. Who was going to pay for great palaces for the people in marble, travertine and stone? Well, nobody. So these buildings are made of prefabricated concrete and they haven't lasted very well, as you can see. Or they've stained and they're grim. And today they're lived in by the poor, by the immigrants and by desperate people. They're sad Parisian suburbs. That's not what they were intended to be, of course. So let's look, though, at what I see as a visionary architecture we can all enjoy, understand, feel, and want to be part of. And I think that's achieved by looking through the other end of the architectural telescope. We should look from grand schemes down to the very small and seemingly humble, like this beautiful Renaissance chapel sitting by itself in the Tuscan countryside or its successor, look at this, a pilgrimage chapel in the middle of a field in Westphalia in Germany. A simple, beautiful chapel in a field, a farmer's field in Westphalia in Germany, doing nothing other than encouraging you to come further, further inside, twist around inside its snail-like plan, to light a candle by a shrine, and to look up, look up, look at that through that eye, sort of visionary eye, into whatever you want to see, nature, God, or spirit, the sky, the stars, that's up to you. But this is actually a profoundly spiritual place built of simple concrete, especially thought through though, because the concrete has been poured into burnt out oak. And that's created this wonderful charcoal-like interior and with these little holes punched through it where the light gets in, not just from the top, but from the sides of the building. It's utterly spiritual and beautiful. Look at that. That's, to me, visionary architecture. 
That architect was Peter Zumthor, a Swiss architect, who made his name, I think, really mostly with this building. This is called St. Benedict's Chapel in Graubünden in eastern Switzerland. Look at the ceiling here. It's an eye, um, of course. And look at the simple materials used. It's just pure materiality in a way. But look at the light. Look at the light. This is an architect who knows how to handle the light of the mountains and how to handle materials. In a way, it's utterly simple, but utterly profound at the same time. Look at this. The buildings we've seen just the last two examples, there's no air conditioning, there's no fluorescent lighting, there's no massive mechanical services, no huge amount of energy. They're pure architecture, but they're working buildings in the service of the imagination, the spirit and vision. And architects through the centuries, really brilliantly visionary architects, have achieved this not just in fields in the middle of nowhere, but in the centre of cities. Look at this Baroque church. It's by the uh, architect Borromini, Francesco Borromini, and he squeezed the most complex, fascinating, interesting church into a tight city site. And if you look at this plan, look at it, it's almost organic, like the inside of a body. Um, and yet, it's also disciplined by pure geometry. Here's the architect's drawing. And what he created, what he shaped, was a building at once natural, mathematical, organic, technical, very beautiful. And when you're in that space, you're just transported. You're lifted away from the busy, noisy city of Rome, just outside its front door. But that architecture doesn't have to be expensive. It can be done on a shoestring. This is a church in Uruguay the Church of Christ the Worker, by an engineer called Eladio Dieste, who wouldn't claim to be an architect. And he created these superb buildings, really, really cheaply buildings, by inventing, by imagining and envisioning a new form of brick structure that can be made of local bricks really, really cheaply and creating buildings of great imagination that people love. And this is in a very you know, poor working class area by the sea. But people love to be here because Eladio Diaste made something special for them in recent years that normal conventional architecture would be too expensive to do the same thing with. And look here, look at this chapel in the Pampas, about 120 miles from uh, Rosario in Argentina. It's by an architect, Campadonico. And what he wanted to show you here was an article of faith when you stand in a simple brick structure made of, re of bricks taken from an old collapsed farm buildings, he wanted you to be inside and to see, this is a religious experience of course in a Catholic country, he wanted you to see Christ's cross appearing around the walls of the buildings, the sun moved round it, and that cross only forms its complete section. It only becomes complete at the point the sun sets. It's very beautiful. And look how simple the building is. No power, again, very little in terms of electricity or services. It's an architectural vision done cheaply. Now look at this. We saw Le Cabusier earlier, and he didn't get things right with his plan for Azin and those early tower blocks. But by the 1940s, he had learned a lot, and he showed how you could create working-class housing in a visionary scheme that so special, working class housing, remember, they're so special that today this, the Unité d'Habitation in Marseille, is lived in almost exclusively by middle class professionals, artists, journalists, writers, filmmakers, and of course, in particular, I would say the majority of people here are architects. Um, they absolutely love it because this is a building with true vision. Um, yes, it's become a middle class. I know you said ghetto, certainly not a ghetto if it's middle class, very smart. Look at this, up on the roof, the ventilation duct is like a sculpture. There's a swimming pool for children, a clubhouse, a running track. They're the children, working class children at the time in the 1950s playing here. Something that's so important about this building, the Unité d'Habitation, is that it relates intricately and beautifully to its surroundings. And that to me is one of the key thoughts about visionary architecture. Today, very many buildings are designed just to sit down one, two, three individually in particular spaces. The truly visionary architecture connects in every way. And you can see that, I think, still at its best in Italy, in those Tuscan hill towns that so many of us love. This is Pienza, a town 
built, an ideal town built in the very early re Renaissance, commissioned by a man who became a pope, Pope Pius II. So, of course, he had grand palaces and grand churches. But what's important is that the buildings, the little town, connects entirely to its landscape. It's all of a piece. And in the 20th century, one or two architects thought, well, could we do that? Could we resurrect that idea of the Italian hill town and create something beautiful where architecture, grand and humble, all goes together, and people of all classes and all creeds and all backgrounds could live in somewhere special? The Welsh architect, Clough William Zellis, built this wonderful fantasy holiday village in Port Merion in, on the Welsh coast. Um, a holiday village, yes, but also he built it as a kind of exercise showing you what a town might be like. You could put modern buildings here, by the way, instead of the ones Clough did, but the idea is this lovely cluster of bringing together of architecture, landscape. And here's Clough William Zellis on the right with a rather famous American visitor. That's, of course, the American architect Frank Lloyd Wright, who came to see it. But visionary projects can also come from somewhere left field, as we say. Some of the most inspiring buildings of the mid-20th century weren't conventional schools, cathedrals, colleges, and so on. They were these. This is the Norris Dam, the first of the dams of the Tennessee Valley Authority, built under the direction of the New Deal. Franklin Delano Roosevelt's New Deal for America to take it out of the Depression. And look at this. Well, architects and engineers worked hand in hand here. The architect, the American-Hungarian architect, Lank, produced these exquisite, powerful buildings. People came from all over the world to see them now, and interesting, they really did, because one of the people that came to see the Norris Dam was Le Capuzier, the French architect. And you can see here in this 1950s building in Firmini in France, this is a sports and arts centre. Look at it. Of course, it is the Norris Dam, if you like, reimagined by Le Capuzier. Very striking. And he used that idea, too, of those great American dams, combined with his own thoughts about concrete architecture and space and connecting buildings to their landscape, which those dams do, in wonderful buildings like this. This is the monastery of La Tourette near Lyon in France. Brutally simple concrete building. But look at those spaces. This is a cheap, poor building in terms of construction materials, but it's deeply spiritual and deeply expressive. Well, could other countries do something similar in a different tradition? What about the Brits, who are slightly more old-fashioned than the Americans? Well, look at this. This is the Ellen Valley in Mid Wales. And this is one of the great dams pumping a cavalry charge of water over these, through these arches and down these granite walls, um, mixing architecture, engineering and landscape. This was the work of engineers of Birmingham City Council, not architects. But look how beautifully they designed it. Look how visionary that scheme is. But again, big visions are one thing. We can learn from tiny visions too, the palm your hand moment. And we can learn from everyday living sometimes, from ordinary people, not professionals. What's this? This is one of the surviving hutongs, or traditional courtyard housing schemes in Beijing. And this is what a firm of young architects in Beijing have done today. They've recreated the hutongs. They can say, we don't need this great big high-rise high -rise housing that's covered Chinese cities in the last 30 years. We can actually go back down to ground and learn from ordinary people, learn from ordinary experience, and actually, as a result, create something far more visionary. In Japan, the Japanese architect Tadao Ando built this, designed and built this. What is it? It's a wedding chapel. Nothing more than that. It's a simple box, but it's the connection to the landscape that matters. Look at this. This is summer, of course, and this is winter. It's beautiful, isn't it? And very simple. But it takes a visionary eye to see it. Somebody else would have come along and built a big, solid box of a building, and you'd have none of this magic. <laughs> this is Tadao Ando again. This is what? Well, it's the head of a Buddha coming up above lavenders. You can see that. This is a wonderful thing, and the lavender will spread all over here in the next few years, and so the structure will almost disappear. This is a Buddhist cemetery in Hokkaido, uh, in the northern island of Japan, by Ando, and you reach it by, look, by a long, long tunnel. The heart, you reach the heart of the cemetery, the shrine under a long tunnel, and you see again that eye at the end, the visionary eye encouraging you out, and then to the Buddha, and looking up into through another eye, another oculus, up into the heavens, to the sky. 
it's unpretentious and beautiful. And when it's all overgrown by lavender, people will love it for generations. Can we build modern houses in that tradition? Yeah, look at this. This is the Scottish Highlands. A lovely modern house. Look at it. Beautifully fitting into its landscape. We don't have to build rubbish, junk housing for ordinary people. We should build this type of housing for ordinary people. These are the standards we should set ourselves. Creating an architecture that fits into its landscape, its setting, its culture. And you can do that with bits and pieces of buildings. Where's this? Well, this is the rooftop of an apartment block in Barcelona by the architect Antoni Gaudi. And look at this, the helmets you see, what look like sort of warrior's helmets or chimneys. Look at that play that Gaudi made and that you can see in buildings since then. Stefano Burri in Milan has designed these apartment blocks, Bosca Verticale, a vertical forest. Apartment blocks covered in trees and this one works. It's pretty. The Italian architect Aldo Rossi designed this floating theatre in Venice for a 1979 festival. And the point of it is that it floated among buildings that actually appear to be like ships in a city on water, where boats and sky and sea, water architecture are one and the same thing. And where, and this is really important, where the humblest buildings, look at this little mishmash of very ordinary buildings in Venice, but they're very picturesque, and a church you can see here that was never finished, San Pantano, something very ordinary, can turn into something magical at, in this case, a coin being inserted into a lighting box and a chapel inside. Look at this paint, ceiling painting by Fumiani. Look at it does, it stretches that unfinished church in that humble square up, up, up and out beyond the Venetian sky, far, far into the heavens above us. It's stunning, isn't it? Zaha Hadid in the docks at Antwerp, very recently, before she died, designing this. This is the Port Authority building in Antwerp. It's not gratuitous, even though it's an isolated monument, if you like, because look what it is. It's meant to be. It's the Port Authority building. It's like a ship heaving out into the waters of this enormous port. It's actually gigantic. And the building gives it, that port, a centre. This is the lodestone of the scheme. It's a wonderful idea. Um, in an age when so much architecture can be gratuitous. And on a humble scale, look here, I found this church in a small Belgian town, um, a chapel, and it had been abandoned, and it was a warehouse until a few years ago. Architects moved in, turned it into their studio, and just with these little tiny additions, gave it a visionary light and feel. In Hungary, in Budapest, this is the Farkastret Cemetery, the mortuary chapel. It's a model of the human chest from which the soul leaves when the body dies. It's designed by the architect Imre Makovets, who was a true visionary. And like William Blake, the poet, he believed in angels. And I think, like Blake, he may have seen them too. He had a vision of an architecture that, if he had any precedent, was again back in Barcelona with Antoni Gaudi. Look at the windows here of the Casa Batlo. They are the mullions there. They're like bones or stems of plants. It's an extraordinary way of looking at architecture, but of course we love it. Here's a vision of a building about to be built. This is a whale watching centre in northern Norway by the Danish architect Dorte Mandrup. It is totally part of its landscape. It's a whale, yes, it might sound a bit obvious, but it works, as does this library on the east coast of China. It's actually in a beach resort, a library. What a strange thing to build in a beach resort. But look, it's utterly special. Again, it's part of the landscape. And no building is more part of a landscape than this, the Casa Malaparte on the Isle of Capri, designed and built by the author Cuzio Malaparte. He said it was a self-portrait, a once classical and modern, quizzical, strange, isolated, remote, and utterly beautiful. That kind of vision you can find here in Sarasota. This, of course, is the Umbrella House, very famous, designed and built by your, perhaps your greatest architect who's worked here, that might be controversial, Paul Rudolph. When architects have visions that are convincing, this is Christopher Wren who designed St Paul's Cathedral in London, they create buildings that don't just move us, and we don't just use them, but they stay in the imagination through generations. Generations of artists look at them. War photographers in the Blitz is St Paul's standing as a symbol of London when bombed, of course, by Adolf Hitler. 
and there's St Paul's after the Second World War at the time London was to be rebuilt. My grandfather's printing press was somewhere down there. Um, St Paul's today with those nightmare, I'm uh, sorry, those office blocks behind. These visions that we've had over the centuries, from grand visions to strange technical visions, science fiction cities, can lead, that's what I wanted to say so much, to nothing much at all. Here's a, a modern city. I took this picture off the internet. You tell me where it is. I've no idea. I've no idea where this is either. This is the other end of the spectrum in terms of lack of vision, pure suburban sprawl. I think this is in America. I hope it's not in Florida. But again, you tell me. I don't know where that is. There's something we need to do. It's back to that William Blake poem. You need, especially in this age, an age of excess and an age where we can't really travel to explore, to again explore from a fresh eye, to look afresh at our world, as if we were young again, to see grains of sand out there that we can contain and know and make something very beautiful. And that vision doesn't come from great textbooks, from great theories, from grand plans. It comes from inside us, and it comes especially when we're able to see a heaven in a wildflower right at home. Because home is where you come from, home is where you start, and home is where most of you, most of us, are having to work from now. Our vision needs to come from nothing that's huge outside us and cold and icy, but something warm and special that's right here in these hands and through these eyes. Thank you very much.